First Class actually came about um, the idea for it uh, during X-Men 2. We were filming, we were at the Vancouver Film Studios, and I don't know, one thing led to another. We're talking about kids, and I said, oh, wouldn't it be funny to see young Cyclops, young Wolverine, young Storm? And I said, we should do a young X-Men. And we all went, yeah, yeah, good idea, good idea. And we all talked about it and talked about it. And then, of course, went back to the movie, and one movie led to another, and we never moved forward until Simon Kinberg read the First Class comics and went to the studio and said, hey, how about doing X-Men First Class? Our first instinct was actually to make it more of a high school movie, to make it more about just the origin of the school. And it just, it didn't work. It wasn't fresh enough in terms of the actual storytelling, and it wasn't in, in the sense of it did resemble too much Twilight and John Hughes and these other movies. It wasn't fresh enough in terms of the characters. We wanted to create characters we hadn't seen in the franchise before on film. And that's around the time that Brian Singer got involved. When I was directing X-Men 1 and 2, I would always think about the past when telling the actors what to do to inform their present behavior. So to be able to actually go back and, and execute that past that I had in my imagination was nice. When Brian became involved, we f refocused all the attention onto Eric and Charles. It had always been focused on Charles and Eric, but the age has changed. We realized that it would be better if we made the X-Men a little bit younger, the students younger. And then from that grew out the story that we're doing now. You know, we started talking about the villain, who would be the villain. And I had always wanted to do Hellfire Club. So I brought them up and that, and they really intrigued Brian. And then Brian came up with the story setting it against the Cuban Missile Crisis. The first order of business was to figure out at what period in history would Professor Xavier Magneto have been in their mid-20s. And we figured, okay, early 60s. You know, what was happening during the 60s? Well, it was the height of the Cold War. And I think it was, it was an exciting opportunity to explore what is ultimately a contemporary concept in this historical context. We talked to Brian about directing X-Men First Class. He had to leave because he was already committed to another film. Brian was under a hold, under a contract to Warners. We all wanted him to stay on, and so he came on as, as one of our producers to, you know, stay as involved as possible. We just started making a list of directors that we thought could step in, could handle a movie like this that's not just complex technically, but also tonally and thematically, and somebody that could handle the, the texture of the film and not lose any of that within the action and the visual effects and all the other things they had to balance. And we came up with some really interesting guys and some interesting candidates. Originally, when we, we set out looking for directors, uh, there was lists of many directors, and Matthew wasn't on any of them because he had already been involved briefly with uh, X-Men 3. It didn't work out, so he, he was not considered. X3 was... It was a weird process. It definitely burnt a bridge at Fox. I mean, they f I think they felt very let down when I said I was leaving. Although I've, you know, I felt like I'd done my job pretty well for them because they didn't have a script when I got onto X3. So in six days, Kimberg, me, and Zach Penn got the draft, got a draft done. He cast a lot of the movie. Um, he prepped a lot of the movie. A lot of the crew that was ultimately the crew of the film were people that he had hired. Um, Brett Ratner very valiantly took the movie on when Matthew left, but. A lot of the reasons that Matthew left, some of them were personal reasons, and some of them were also, it was a very tough schedule. When we signed on for X-Men 3, and Matthew had directed one movie, he had done Layer Cake, he was desperate to do X-Men. We pushed really, really hard to get it. We got it. And then I think just the, you know, we came from a background of making small British movies. I was really applying low budget, independent filmmaking process to big budget filmmaking. Um, and, you know, the process is, is very different. I think what Matthew's feelings are now, and when this came up again, was that he's now had more experience. Uh, he, you know, he has a team around him that he trusts. He feels like he knows exactly what he's doing. And I think his feeling was that where the short deadline was something that worried him before, this time he felt confident that he could do it and he could make the movie he wanted to make in that amount of time. I just finished Kick-Ass, literally. We just finished it, it's gone to cinema. The idea of doing a movie so quickly was wasn't even on my radar, so I was think, all I could think about was having a vacation. Right around that time, I went to go see Kick-Ass in the theaters, and I emailed him immediately when I came out of the movie theater, and he emailed me back saying, uh, are you in LA right now, which is where I live, and he doesn't, are you in LA right now, because I happen to be here. A bloody volcano erupted in Iceland, so I couldn't leave. So I was stuck here, which was literally this time last year. And so I met Matthew for a drink, and in the context of that first conversation, 
I told him about X-Men First Class, and I saw his eyes light up a little bit, because I knew he wanted to direct an X-Men movie um, under the right auspices, and he got excited about it. It just so happens that that same night in that same restaurant, Brian Singer was also having dinner. An actor named Aaron Johnson, who was the lead in Kick-Ass, introduced Matthew to me. Brian, hey, I'm Matthew. And he was like, you're joking. And so we went off and, said, and we just had a couple of drinks. And Matthew was, was like, well, let me read the script. I read the script and liked it. But I'm going to have to um, um, rewrite the whole bloody thing. The story and the, the general shape and direction of the story uh, had been formed and existed, but Matthew certainly wanted to uh, take things, various things in different directions. And I know they were nervous, and I said, no, look, guys, I'm going to stick to the story, and I, but I'm just going to craft a film out of it. And then I was laughing, going, I pulled out of X3 because I didn't think there was enough time. Now I'm signing, signing on to a movie where I've got less time, you know, I have to create a whole new world, period. So I have to create a period, you know, new actors. Our schedule was insane. Our schedule was, uh, we were, I mean, we had a script, but we were still working on the script while prepping, which is very difficult because Matthew was the writer. So he had to spend half of the day writing and half of the day prepping, and you need a director full time. But they did an immense amount of work to the screenplay in terms of changing character arcs, changing character dynamics, creating new characters. One of the main things we felt was that the main core relationship for it should be between Charles and Eric. In earlier versions, there had been perhaps more of a love triangle. Moira was a very, very central character who perhaps drove a lot of the elements of the plot. I think we were both just fascinated by the idea of the, you know, the friendship that was always hinted at in the earlier films in the trilogy. I will bring you home, old friend. And I ask only one thing in return. Don't get in my way. You know, this absolute respect and friendship that existed even through becoming sort of sworn enemies. And that was something we really, really wanted to explore. If the story between Charles and Eric is on some level this, you know, tragic romance, you've got to arrange the other elements in that way too. Yeah, in this case, it's, uh, it's you have Hank and you have Raven, who end up being kind of the B-story version of the same thing you're seeing playing out with Charles and Eric. It's the, the making and then breaking of a relationship. And then you have to take characters, you know, like Moira, you know, or Sebastian Shaw, and say, well, how do they fit in terms of the tension between Eric and Charles? Come on, time for the tour. Those group dynamics and friendship dynamics and couple dynamics, I think are just endlessly fascinating to all of us. And, um, but it's certainly one of the things that made it such a pleasure to write. Then our budget was too big. Same problem as uh, on all movies. So we had to rewrite the script, take out chunks to try to you know, squeeze the budget. But a script is like you know, a whole pack of dominoes. If you take one part out, the rest all falls. So it was trying to smooth and cement over these, these changes and make the script still work as a whole. So there was massive amounts of rewriting that happened, and obviously all the prep, and the casting of a movie that's this complex in terms of the cast, and all the rehearsal time. All of that was from first inception to first shot, six months at the most. I was terrified thinking, hold on, am I that stupid? But there was a little bit of me that um, was still, you know, I came so close to making an X-Men movie, and I really do love the X-Men universe that I thought this this is your last chance probably ever to do it. Shooting? Yeah. Okay. Let's get them in and film. I think for a lot of the directors that we had talked to about this film, part of what was daunting for them was how do I balance seven, ten different characters' point of views and maybe five or six real storylines. A lot of them started gravitating toward can we just make it Eric and Charles's movie? And it is at its core Eric and Charles's movie, but it is also the story of Beast and Mystique. There's there's tons of different B, C, D love stories, villain plots in the film that are happening. And I think it needed a director like Matthew who could balance all those things and keep them alive in his mind to make it work. In originally crafting the story, there were certain key mutants that were very important for the story to function and for the relationships to evolve. We debated who were gonna be the other X-Men. The feeling was that we needed mutants with abilities that we hadn't seen before, uh, looks that we hadn't seen before, and uh, you know, obviously powers and gifts that we hadn't seen before. Therefore, that's why we went to Havoc. Havoc is Scott Summer's younger brother. And 
The real lore of the first class of X-Men was Scott Summers, and way later came Havoc. This was something that I personally fought, and I think I'm, I was wrong. I don't know if I was wrong, but it didn't matter because he had a cool power we hadn't seen, and he had an attitude that we needed. Azazel was another controversial one because we had seen it, we had done it with Nightcrawler, and I felt there might be some resentment to Azazel because um, people love Nightcrawler so much. The great news was the way that Matthew cast him, and that was totally Matthew, and it made me really like love Azazel. And so we just ended up with a fair amount of characters who, you know, like Darwin and Alex and Angel, I mean, people that don't necessarily fit together in the books, but for us, in terms of fleshing out an ensemble cast, um, made a great deal of sense. You do want to be true to the continuity of the movies that themselves are not true to the continuity of the comics. And so we would err usually on the side of being true to the continuity of the films, because we felt like the mass audience that goes to the movies is more familiar, actually, with the movie rules than they are with the comic rules. One of the things that, you know, possibly is a kind of a trademark of all the X-Men movies is that the casting's been incredible. You know, Brian got the series off to an amazing start. We grounded it with the world's best actors, knowing, first of all, that the movie would come to life and come to life well. And secondly, that then we would attract other really good actors. So we followed that tradition in first class. I think John Houston said this, that directing is 90% casting. I would say it's more 70% casting. I think there's some other stuff that comes into it. But if you cast it wrong, it doesn't matter how well you move the camera, cut it, put the music, light it, he's right. In the end of the day, a good actor, you can just get them in focus and the film will work. Part of the way that Matthew casts is just show me great actors. Show me great actors, and then I'll find the one that fits the part. James is the first actor we cast. I've always been a fan of James. I think he's, he's a tremendous actor. When initially somebody said, what about James McAvoy for Charles? I said, it's the greatest idea I've ever heard. He will never do it. Why would he take on somebody else's role in which he's only going to be compared to Patrick Stewart? He's not Patrick Stewart yet, you know what I mean? Thank God. Can you imagine me trying to do a Patrick Stewart impression? We both came to the conclusion very quickly, no, we're doing our own. This is your own Professor X. It's not the Patrick Stewart version. Well, I thought I'd have fun playing this character to begin with. I thought there was a lot of uh, opportunity to have a laugh, which I generally like to do. I thought he had a good sense of humour, which, again, I felt was sufficiently different from the character in the other movies. That was the main thing that drew me to it. Also, it filmed 40 minutes from my front door, so that was a huge bonus. <laughs> James McAvoy, one of the world's best actors. He's just incredible. And then we had a, a rather extensive search for the Eric Lencher role. Well, what was funny was we cast James and then they wanted Eric to be younger. And I had some big arguments with some people at the studio and they, they were worried that he was just too old. And Paul Michael then came in for the audition and he was playing um, Carl Jung. So he had this huge, ridiculous moustache. He, he looked 45, <laughs> he looked just crazy. And he did this audition and he was amazing. Do you have an appointment? I want to make a substantial deposit. We're not that kind of bank. I'm not that kind of customer. I just knew he was right. He's so charismatic. And I kept explaining to them what Magneto was going to be in this movie. And if I went younger, it was just going to be harder to pull it off. Turn away and cut. What we were trying to do, I think, was bring a whole sort of fresh input to the story and sort of start at scratch. You know, I remember in the sort of beginning phases, I said to Matthew, you know, should I start looking at Ian McKellen as a young man? We're going to go down that route. And I, he wasn't very keen on it. I thought, OK, that's kind of interesting. So I'm doing my own thing with this now. I think he was born to play this particular role. I really do. We were really interested in the origin story of a villain where you don't actually ever judge the villain. In fact, the opposite. You actually empathize with the villain. So much of that hangs on Michael. If Michael were not as compelling in the movie, if he were not as human in the movie, if he were not as just watchable in every single scene, that moment at the end when he says, come with me, you wouldn't feel at least a little bit of leaning forward of, okay, I'll come with you. You have to feel like at the end of this film, I don't know which side I would choose. When they do break, hopefully the audience will be like, oh no, you know, great things could have happened if these two men with sort of opposing theories did join forces. And hopefully that's what the audience will feel at the end. Are you sure we can't get you a refill, Bob? No. I know for the fact that when Matthew said, how about Kevin Bacon for the bad guy, a lot of people up top were like, huh? 
That's weird. That's exactly why it's good, I think, because it is a different direction for a movie to choose a bad guy, I think. You don't want a clear-cut villain. You want a villain that has many different colors and many different shades so that it's not always clear that they're the bad guy. You almost want a villain like Ian McKellen that you kind of like and that you understand. Kevin Bacon was at the top of all of our lists. We all really, I mean, Kevin Bacon's about the coolest guy on the planet, so we definitely wanted him. And we were just lucky enough that he said yes. You know, aside from the, the you know, the kind of evil side to him, I've kind of pictured him as kind of a Hugh Hefner type. And, and early on, Matthew Vaughn and I spoke about the fact that the guy would be the type of person who can very easily manipulate other people. And then Kevin's performance in the movie is interesting because he plays it as somebody who thinks, and this is always the best villains are people that think they're the hero of the movie. And Kevin plays it as, in his mind, the hero of the movie. Yeah, just stay with the money. Stay, stay on the money. where you want to be. <laughs> He's basically a sociopath in that, you know, I think that the morality that the rest of the world is functioning with does not really apply to Sebastian Shaw. It's a quiet menace and you know he's capable. You know he's got the brain power and um, that he's capable of any evilness that he wants to do. Colonel Hendry. Yes, ma'am. Frost. Emma Frost. Sebastian Shaw's associate. January Jones brought like a cold frostiness to Emma Frost. Once we decided she was who we wanted, we wanted to make sure. So we had to do that embarrassing thing of, look, can we have a camera on you in your bikini? Which is, sounds really cheesy, but you know, you gotta know. And of course you look fantastic. January obviously has the looks down, but also in terms of what you, when you watch her on Mad Men, there's a sort of, you're never gonna get all the way inside this. That's perfect for the role. Coming from a day job where there's a lot of dialogue and I have to, you know, do a lot of emotionally draining things to go and to do something that's really different for me and and fun and sometimes silly and weird but really great and I've been really embracing it. Does he need that? Why does he need that? He just, he just appears. Uh, you Sorry, specifically guys. said I'd have air. <laughs> <laughs> I play Azazel, Azizel, or Azazizel, depending on the who you are and how you pronounce it. He just says whatever they say you now. I think he's heard it so many times that he just mispronounces it. Azizel, Azazel, Azazazazel. It just rubs me the wrong way. Jeez. <laughs> I've been involved in very in some very big movies, you know, slightly out of focus behind some very expensive actors, but there nonetheless. And when Matthew, who's a friend of mine, said, you know, he was doing X-Men and wanted me to be involved at whatever level, you know, to be involved with Matthew's films is as important to me as anything, so it's fun. The bigger his projects get, the smaller my parts get. <laughs> but that's fine, that's fine, mate. I mean, I'm chuffed, I'm chuffed to be involved. The main reason we cast him is that every film we've made with him has done well, whereas every film we've made without him has not. So Jason Fleming is basically lucky. No, it's not that, he's a great actor. Why wouldn't you keep employing him? You know, it's not superstition, guys. Because this is the end of all your fucking lives. Blah, blah, blah. This is scary shit. <laughs> when you get a couple of people who are a bit known, not that we're humongous superstars or anything like that, and Kevin Bacon's pretty massive, um, it frees you up and it's just nice, you know, when you've got a couple of faces that you recognise, that's enough. You don't have to, you can give some new people a break, you know. The talent is really prominent in London, but the studio, rightfully so, felt that there was too many English actors and that it had to be a little bit more American. So at a certain point we had to keep looking in LA. I flew back and forth from LA to London constantly casting because Matthew couldn't leave. And they've got little Caleb who's a lunatic, wonderful actor, really nice kid. Eddie Gathegi, Jennifer Lawrence and Nick Holt, just great, 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 great young actors. Lucas Till, uh, Zoe Kravitz, they're just fantastic, really good fun. Um, Rose Byrne playing Moira McTaggart, who's just ridiculously good and lovely. I've basically said everybody's fantastic and really good fun. I must be lying through my teeth. Hate them all. We should think of secret code name. I like that they just let them be young for a little while. Such an important, huge fan base, and I'm just so afraid of, you know, you just want to do everything right and you don't want to let anybody down and, and, and hopefully live up to expectations. Because at first, I didn't, I didn't really think about it that much, because if you think about it all at once, it would probably be way too intimidating. In a way, I'm just like, reading the script, it's so dense and there's so much in it and the special effects and everything, I was just fascinated to see how it actually, literally, would take place, you know, in terms of what you shoot and what, you know, the whole sort of unfolding of the whole thing. Uh, it's pretty incredible. And it's, I never usually get the jobs that I want, and this was the first time 
I really got that huge project, and it was just like, nah. the look of Kelsey Grammer's Beast. He loved Kelsey's work, you know, as an actor, but he wanted Beast to look, in terms of his hair, wilder, more like an animal. He wanted something not only that looked younger, but looked more feral and uh, more animalistic. Uh, he kept saying, you know, it's a beast, it's a beast. And uh, getting to exactly what he meant by uh, uh, it's a beast was, was a part of the uh, challenging part of the process. I had worked with Alec Gillis previously and he had always come through and always done terrific work. So we went to, to him and there was a fabulous sculptor, make, special effects makeup man, David Elsie, from London and they teamed up and worked together. There was a brief moment when we first started where it was like, well, we could just like take this whole problem away and it could all be digital. Or maybe it's like, it's the makeup from here up and digital from here down. But I think we just got to design it so it looks okay when he's not talking. Yeah. And then when he is talking, you go digital. Yeah, yeah. give you a virtual mouth with big teeth, a yeah. broader opening than you can accommodate yourself. It seemed very difficult to do, to come up with. And first of all, you want it to look like Nick, and yet it became too cat like, it became too wolf like. You know, we had to somehow find an animal that wasn't so distinctive that you felt like you were looking at a cat and yet still make it look like Nick Holt. They were at a point where they really should have had a lockdown character by then. And, you know, all eyes uh, are looking at the makeup team to solve the problem. So we were quickly trying to, to, to regroup and come up with something that would, was, was going to satisfy Matthew's vision. Because we had Nick Holt, uh, who you would see as Nick Holt, as a human being, and then transform, it was perhaps a little less important that we hang on to an exact likeness of him. And that freed it up for us to explore some different, more beastly possibilities. The trick we should get a fake head made we sign off on. Then once we've got the perfect head, then we can say, how the we put it on him? Completely separately, ADI uh, in the States and us over in England, uh, we had done two maquettes and see which one he went for. And the cool thing was that out of all this, you know, lineup of five or six sculptures, the director said, I like that one and that one, and they were the ones that Dave and I had done. There were subtle differences between the two, um, but really, they, these things could have been brothers. So we were able to then say, okay, this is great, this is great, let's combine aspects of them, uh, you know, over an actual life cast of the actor. I thought that it was important that we, we have Nick coming through. We could get a very animalistic look by working with Nick so that he could still act and then put the makeup on top of that. There we go. All right. Oh, thank you so much. Fantastic. One of the very first things we did was we made some plumpers and put them in his mouth and played around with how big we could literally put teeth in his mouth and still have him be able to talk and stuff. And we may have to dub some lines, but... Whose f***ing phone is that? <laughs> and right up until the very first makeup test that we did, people were still saying, well, you know, I guess, I guess we can just make the mouth work, you know, digitally. And I was saying, well, you know, I think you're going to be surprised at what Nick's going to be able to do. Does this, does this work? Oh, yeah. Without the, um, without it being attached? 
Yeah. Okay. Matthew was very big on fur, not hair, but fur. He didn't want hair. He wanted it to be animalistic. He wanted it to be like fur. That's perfect. You like that? You like that? Right. Yes. Cool. Oh, that's all shit. shit. No offense. No, no. Shit, 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 never shit. see it again. Throw it under there. All shit. That's good. Good? That's <laughs> brilliant. Cool. cool. Okay. But the challenge was with fur, it has a very, very heavy under fluff, so it is very, very fluffy. Um, so in order to try and make that into a hairstyle and blend it from the facial hair all the way through, it was really difficult because you know we couldn't just get a fur coat and put it on his head. You know it wasn't going to work. So a lot there was a lot of kind of engineering involved with getting lots of different tapered hair, which is. You know, that's kind of a real characteristic of fur is that the hair is tapered and not cut. Well, and it's a very risky thing to, to do as well. Once you've made up your mind mm. that you're going to do fur and not hair, that's it. You know, the, is there going to be no, no going back? You can't, you're not going to be able to change it. You can't style it. You can't cut it. If you've ever tried to, you know, put a funny haircut on your dog, and, and I know I have, you know, <laughs> and uh, tried to comb the hair around, you'll notice it just goes right back to where it starts again but he was adamant. Well, it looks a million times better already. That's just good way When we brought Nick onto set and Matthew looked at him and he just smiled, you know, it was a little little smile, because he's kind of a stoic guy, right? Now, this is the stuff, because it looks like proper fur now, not like, yeah. I mean, you want to take a feel it's nice. Is it real? Yeah. No, of That's course not. Yeah. Lou's been well, making well. it walked around, inspected him very carefully, closely, and said, I could shoot this today. I, I'm, I'd be happy to shoot this. And we were like, oh, thank God. Well, I'm, I'm really impressed. I'm like, I can't, very good. I mean, if I had to shoot this, I'd be happy. And it was great. It was a great illustration to everybody just what an actor in a makeup can do. And the mask actually moves very well, but you do have to make your performance bigger and learn how to kind of move in it again. So it's just trying to get that right and make it look normal um, or, or natural as possible, which it just takes time, I suppose, and, 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 and getting used to how, how it works. Once you put that suit on, and, and you talked to him, you totally forgot it was Nick. I totally would. He really became someone else. Nick was up at sort of two in the morning for an eight o'clock on set time. And I think Jennifer began to wear her down after a while because, you know, her call was actually, I think was even earlier than his. And, you know, and it's a, it's a tedious, tedious process. There's no CG for me. Um, it's, it's all, it's the same technology, the same methods they were using on Rebecca remained the original Mystique 10 years ago. But it was just finding the process because we didn't have the people who did the original. So it's finding the right shade of blue. Not They felt that the last blue might fade in the dark, so we were going lighter, but not as light as Avatar. So we did, I would say, 20 plus tests to find the right shade of blue on Mystique. I thought I was just gonna lay down Could you go, um, at, for like mind? six hours you go to and just like go to sleep door? while this is going to happen. Yeah, I didn't realize shop. I too and was gonna have to. I, to I had the theory of when I was really tired, <laughs> when I was on like my seventh hour, I was like, why don't you just dip me in a bathtub of blue? But it's, no, it's all airbrushed. Uh, they place the scales first and then that's telesis and glue, uh, latex. And then they do three layers of airbrush blue and then five layers of splattering of all different colors, which is really cool. It's, it's the worst when it's going on, but it looks really cool. It makes it look like 3D marble. It takes six girls to paint the full body and it takes about seven hours to do that process. I know that everybody feels sorry for me, but we have so much fun. It's like a sleepover, except I'm naked and being painted. <laughs> so you have a lot of issues and how long your artist can stand to be made up, live in it afterwards because it's very constricting, not in its physical constrictions, just I think it's psychologically very constricting to have lenses in and not be any part of yourself showing at all. At first it was, it's, it was awful because you feel claustrophobic in your own body, in your own skin because you have an itch and you can't scratch it, but now it's, I, I'm used to it now actually. Yeah, except when it's when you're going on hour 11. It starts, I gotta get it off, I gotta get it off. But the, everybody's really wonderful about understanding what it's like under here. <laughs> and we don't have her all blue too often. So it works for her. Because after all of this, it's like, are you kidding? I'm not taking this off. Are you kidding me? This will be, with a painting, this will be two hours, I think. I don't, it's not bad. It's not bad. Matt said when I got the part, because I do a lot of stuff in makeup, which I'm trying to stop doing, <clears throat> and Matt said, Jace, just do one more 
when you see the picture, don't be shocked because we're going to add the tail in post. And I was like, oh, not again. So yeah, he's he's a full on he's a full on mutant. Yeah. What do you think is more prosthetics? Than you? <laughs> Sorry, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> I just fell out my head. Well, the plan for Jason before Jason was cast was that it would be like the bees, a full head prosthetic. But once they cast Jason, I knew straight away that he could be the character Matthew wanted without having all that prosthetic work on. So I found someone straight away just to do some test pieces for me to give that Azizel effect, which is a brow, enhance the brows, enhance the cheekbones and do the rest with the facial and the wig. And Matthew liked it straight away. We again did many tests on what shade of red he should be. It was a whole thing trying to find the right color red because at a certain point he looked like the devil and at a certain point he looked like a man in red makeup. I think we overcame it by adding scars. And I think the scars is something so human and giving him eyes that were just a shade brighter than his own. And the real crowning victory was Francis came up with that sort of black mane of hair that seemed to tie everything in. He looks a little bit like a sort of microwaved Elvis. He's definitely strange looking. He's, he's fantastic casting for the part. You just have to think out of the box and think big and it all works and always have a fantastic team. It runs very well, I have to say. films I've done like this, I always like to let the script lead me in, particularly with the X-Men, the whole world of X-Men is so huge. If you started reading into that, you would spend all your research time just doing comic book research. That's what I tend to try and do with most of the comic book films I've done, is not, not get too overwhelmed by being faithful to the comic in every respect, because the film doesn't always need that. Well, at first I read the script, I thought, oh my god, it's massive. <laughs> was my initial reaction. And the fact that it's set in the 60s, I know straight away there isn't a lot of si early 60s clothing easily available. Sammy Sheldon, who did our costume, was very keen to kind of get that 1960s vibe without necessarily making it feel deeply period. Sammy put a, a wall together in her office um, of each character and all the iterations of, of their looks in the comics. Then, because Matthew had wanted very much the Bond, James Bond element infused throughout, she then pulled references, magazine references for each character. Matthew always discussed from the word go, I want this whole film to look really slick and stylish. And Bond from the early 60s was a big reference to the Sean Connery look. We kind of used that as a style reference for Magneto in his suit. Fondu de leur bien, arraché de leur dents. Ceci est le prix de leur sang. We've kept that, that kind of Bond styling throughout, throughout all the tailoring. They have really given me all the really cool clothes. I mean, I have to say, I, you know, um, James is kind of a little bit annoyed because at the beginning he was like, look, you know, I really like turtlenecks. Can we have sort of turtlenecks? And I ended up getting the turtlenecks. So he's got the sort of more sort of cardigan look, but I have got like some really amazing sort of 60s suits, which, which do sort of seem to, uh, suit me best. Funny enough, I think that sort of thin leg and sort of thin sort of style suit is, is kind of good for me. Whereas Charles is, he's much more kind of free in his self, he's much more comfortable in his self. And he's, it's, it's honest, real, studious, but at the same time st as stylish as we could make it in a reality world. Magnificent, isn't she Bob? Sammy's done an amazing job with the costumes and making them you know, as true as we can to what I think the fans will appreciate, but also something that I can move in, <laughs> move around in. And it's not actually painted on its fabrics and things, but it's minimal, I'll say that. The materials that Sammy bought were so gorgeous for Emma Frost, and all of it had sparkles. All the material was very, very tight, but bendable, stretchable, so that no matter how she moved, it would stay on her. You know, there wasn't that much on her, but it, what was on stayed. I'm always wearing some sort of shade of white or something pearlized, something kind of shimmery. It was sort of a 60s edge, but also there's a, you know, a modern take on that. Of all the characters, she's the most faithful to the comic book looks. Did you like the, um, yeah. the size of the belts? Yeah. You don't think we should Thanks go any day. wider or anything? No, I think the belts, uh, it's, I'm not sure whether they should be a different fabric. 
Matthew and, and Sammy have a great sort of working relationship because they both have this sort of obsession with detail and with getting things kind of grounded in reality. It's like, what is the reason for the exits? Why do they exist the way they do? And so you know, there was a lot of research about kind of pressure suits because they were going in a jet. And you know, Matthew was very keen to get away from the X1, X2, X3 suits. We all felt, you know, that we couldn't be true to the comic in terms of the yellow and blue because, look, if you're gonna go out there and fight crime, you're not gonna wear blue and yellow. You're gonna wear black, you're gonna hide in the night. And we knew that the fans would be expecting them to be blue and yellow, so we threw in a line. Do you actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer, yellow spandex? That was our sort of tip of the hat to the fans. But this time, because we were going back to the first class, we really felt, okay, let's go back to what the old uniforms used to look like. So when we first started designing them, we really went for the basic, basic, basic. It got to be a little too basic. We tried to spiff them up a little bit, but they looked pretty primitive. There was a desire to make them utilitarian or, or have them be functional, but functional not only, uh, uh, well, functional with using 1960s technology. Being 62, there's an awful lot of stuff going on at the time with the Cold War and, you know, all, all the kind of space age stuff. So we looked at space age fashion, space age development within NASA and all that kind of influential stuff from the time. One of the kind of things that we latched onto very early was that the yellow in the suits is, 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 was the original colour of Kevlar. The actual yellow fabric isn't actually Kevlar, it's a copy of it that is woven in silk. Kevlar is very difficult to work with, you can't actually cut it. The blue um, is actually a ballistic nylon that the girls in the workroom have machine stitched through in checkers all the way over it to make the fabric have a texture. So each panel is separately worked on. And then up the sides and the knees and the elbows and the collars are actually um, made of a, a leather. But the leather is actually formed by stitching up and down with some elastic with, with little pieces of string through it so it constantinas it up. So every single piece of them is, is a separate work of art in itself. And all the, they all make kind of stretchy panels so that they can move in them. You can lift it up higher than me. We're changing it. That's not because you're stronger. It's because it's tighter. Hank's one, the idea is that he's kind of had to cut the legs and the arms off to get in it. And it's kind of stretched out for his muscle tone. And obviously the neck, he'd have never got into the collar, so we, you know, we rip, he's ripped that off. <laughs> Charles's has, has more Kevlar around the body because he kind of needs more protection. Well, Magneto's is quite basic because he didn't need so much protection on his body. Havoc has the electronic thing on his chest to hone his power. Banshee has wings. And Mystique's we just made look sexy. <laughs> Hopefully our exits actually have a reason for being what they are, as opposed to just being kind of plucked out of some aesthetic universe. She's had the most incredible battle with the most unwieldy kind of textiles and fabrics and her and her people are fantastic at just doggedly kind of going through and pursuing those things and they just put in the, the most insane amount of effort and hours and this, these things just appear on set. A lot of the things that we make it's not just clothing it, it's kind of props and you know helmets. You start with casting the actor's head and then you clay mold the shape and we work out how big we want it, how it's gonna work with the shape of the face. Then you have to cast them inside and out and then we have to make each one to fit the different actors. So Shaw wears one and Eric wears one and they're both completely different shape because of where your eyes are positioned. So um, it's not just one helmet that fits anyone. Kevin and Michael have got very different head shapes and although yeah, Kevin's will fit on to Michael, but Michael's won't fit back the other way. So I can make that fit on, but then it's very loose. And then, yeah, it's going back the other way. I can't actually get it on at all. Uh, but they have to look like the same helmet. Well, I've got this really quite impressive helmet, uh, <laughs> which uh, I begin to wear towards the end of the film. And uh, actually, after this, I'm going to go check out my later sort of Magneto look, which is complete with cape. It's a wild and crazy helmet, and it's right from the comics. And when we did Ian McKellen's helmet, we toned it down. This time, we went for it. We gave him that helmet. 
Sammy has no notion of when to give up. But, um, you know, Sammy got that because she's a genius. As much as Matthew and we all were inspired by the superhero films, we were more interested in looking actually at the early Bond movies, the Sean Connery Bonds, partly because they did such a cool job of representing this period in a way that still felt muscular and action-oriented. I came very close to doing a Bond movie. I love the character of Bond. And for me, I really loved the idea that Magneto was the young Connery, badass, charming, ruthless, sweet. You know, ev everything that Connery gave to Bond, I knew Fastbander could do to Eric. And that's what drew me in. Matthew was very, very keen to get sort of that, that sort of very Bond-esque style and that sort of genre into this. Um, and in the very early days, we used a lot of that sort of Ken Adam visual reference. You know, the big sweeping ceilings and, 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 and space, just using space. And in the early 60s, you know, there, there are those houses with the sunken living rooms and that very sort of very modern architecture. There were few places in London that had that, so we, could, we couldn't shoot practical, we built everything. Every time I come into a scene, uh, you know, from a, a production design standpoint, I'm, I'm constantly amazed. We went from the Hellfire Club lair, there's a very specific 60s modern style, but not right down the line of 60s modern, and then it was translated so well into my submarine, which has some of the same kind of fabrics and the same sort of look tonally. So you, you get this idea that as a character, I've got my own kind of sense of style, which was really amazing. There's nothing on radar. Mute. Originally in the script, there were these three parts, the control room, the living quarters, and then the, the engine room, which is called the mirror room. And originally in the script, there were corridors connecting them all. And then we discussed that we maybe should put them as a composite, which I think was a smart move. And that was, that was Matthew. Visually, I think it works, it works, it's, it's great. It, I think it's better than ha having all these corridors connecting. You just literally go from one to the other to the other. It, it's crazy because you don't have the, the feeling that you are in a decorated. It's, it's like a submarine. For example, I said, why? The submarine needs higher? It's not necessary, you know, because it would be easier to, to put it in, in the floor is because the submarine is it has to to move you know in other movie uh, the director uh, maybe could move the, the the camera you know but here they, they prefer move the the whole, the, the, the whole submarine so it, it's crazy you know when you come onto a set and you've got like a submarine that's on a jib you know that can break off into three different sections and and then, you know, we're inside in the X-Jet, and that's also on, on this gimbal. It's a real privilege to sort of see how that works and see how, you know, an art department gets something like that together. And, you know, how a sort of idea starts with a pencil and a piece of paper, and then sort of there it is in physical form, and you're walking around inside it. You know, that's, that's pretty impressive. For Matthew, one of the sort of exciting prospects with the, with the movie was to kind of reverse engineer some of the things that the fans already knew and loved. So it's kind of like, oh, you know, did you ever wonder when you were watching X1, 2 or 3 what the X-Jet looked like? Well, this is the first version of it. The money's all going in the hair. Everybody's got exceptional 60s hair, as done by Francis Josephine and Veronica Hannon. First of all, that's important to say. But after that, the rest of the money, I think, went on the X-Jet. Uh, the X-Jet's quite incredible. And funnily enough, the X-Jet messes up everybody's hair because we all get spun around quite a lot in it. We've built this set to revolve 360 degrees, however many times we like, uh, at the speed of 12 revs per minute, which is a, a revolution every six seconds, which is pretty fast. And we, we, we're doing that with the actors in, so they're all having quite a little fairground ride at the same time. The X-Jet's awesome. It really looks fantastic. It's very, very practical. There's lots of switches and buttons, and it's, it's a bit more like a World War II submarine inside than it is the X-Jet that we're used to seeing.
It's, it's loosely based on the American fighter plane, but we obviously there's a lot of artistic license there. We had to make it a little bigger because we had to fit a lot more people in it because the, the, the original plane was much, much smaller and we had to increase the fuselage in order to um, create the seating down the side and also because of the action we wanted to get um, the, the guys falling through the floor, the, the sort of bomb bay doors. The tricky thing was trying to time the, the controls with, with the gimbal's movements to make it look like I was actually flying. Um, but it was just a lot of fun. It was like being at a theme park. And it was weird for them. I mean, first of all, you, you know, they're sitting for hours strapped into this thing, being thrown around and thrown around. So some of their panic when the X jet tilts and, and rolls over was real because we were really doing it to them. But they also had incredible. really interestingly production designed and shot. It just has so much detail and texture to it. Um, then, once we started thinking in the context of the 60s and the Cuban Missile Crisis, it, it all started to expand visually, aesthetically. The whole war room uh, scenarios in the movie, you had the Russian war room and the American war room. And we, we used Australia House in London, which was essentially a very ornate, classical building. Again, with shiny floors and shiny columns. And he always wanted to have the American war room had to top it. Matthews had this image, always from the start, of the, the classic Dr. Strange Love Ken Adams set of basically the table, the light, and the floor. And it's trying to introduce that into this kind of a movie. And action. I was very nervous about the mansion. We've used several mansions. The first movie was shot in Toronto. So our exterior was a mansion in upstate New York, which is where Xavier's school is supposed to be. Once we moved coast, and now we're shooting in Vancouver, we went on to Victoria Island and found the Royal Academy and used that for our exterior and interiors, a lot of interiors, on X2 and, and 3 in Last Stand. And the next one won, we added the games, and that was shot in LA at Greystoke Mansion. So, you know, we do this all the time. We take a little bit of this location, a little bit of that location, put it together with another exterior, and you think it's all one. When it came to doing it this time, we looked at a lot of mansions. And it, we did struggle to find a house that would tie into the whole look of, of the original mansions. We ended up finding um, Inglefoot House and basically completely panelling it. <laughs> we added all the panelling to the house, all up the stairs everywhere, to tie it all in so that you felt like you were in the original house. We had some of the sets, some of the interiors from the X-Men movies flown over. So we did have some of those and the rest we just matched. When you shoot in stately homes here in the UK, it's very difficult because 
a lot of them, are, they've got silk carpets down, they've got you know, very valuable things in, so you can't traipse a film crew over the carpet. So we ended up putting our own floors in, because we, we wanted, where, where we were doing the gym, that was actually um, a living room, and it had a silk carpet down, but we wanted to put a hardwood floor in there. So it's not a case of just pulling the carpet up, we have to put our own floor down to get a lovely shiny floor for all the gym equipment, but then you've got a problem because then all the doors don't open because so we then had to take all the doors off make our own doors <laughs> the range of different environments that we, we, we were having to create you know going from things like the hellfire the x-jet the sub you know and then going to you know oxford apartments and it, there, there was a whole range of stuff to do it, it it's, it's it's a dream kind of film to do The world of visual effects is just mind-blowing. It's like what you can do is just extraordinary. On this movie, we are unbelievably lucky to have been working with John Dykstra. Lucky on so many levels because he's wildly talented, he's incredibly nice, but mainly he made Star Wars. So it's kind of like, actually, he could be really shit and really unpleasant, and I would still be really happy. John Dykstra is the unsung hero of X-Men First Class. We never could have made this movie without him. We never could have made this movie on time without him. I mean, John is such a pro and is so creative that he would just start coming up with all the, the ideas. I actually couldn't have made this film without John because I've got to, it was, as I said, the accelerated process of everything. I had to hand batons over to people. With John, it was a very weird feeling. I didn't know him that well and go, here you go. And he took it and is meant to run 100 meters, he ran 1,000 meters and gave it back. I was like, wow, well done. So he won my confidence very quickly and he is pulling off the impossible right now and, um, you know, deserves a lot of credit for getting this film made. Send it across the boat, from the bow to the stern, ripping its way through, tears out the back. Digital has liberated me from the business of being an engineer and the guy on set who says you can't wear blue pants when you're on blue screen and I get to spend much more time thinking about the design of effects with regard to how they integrate into the story. My experience with Matthew has been that he's allowed me to collaborate on, on his movie. Uh, he's just been very generous and, and le letting me contribute ideas, not so much to the storytelling, although in a way it affects the storytelling, but to the design of the visuals. I'll add a little camera jostle to it. And, and the, so what you need to do is it's just grip. Yeah, your reaction to... Yeah, exactly. Jesus, we're going into this thing, and then I'll zoom you away. The great thing with working with John is that you meet Thanks, some man. visual effects guys who kind of believe they can do everything. You know, as far as they're concerned, it's kind of like, don't shoot anyone. Just shoot green stuff against green, and we'll just build it all later. Whereas John is very much a kind of, you know, we can get it in camera, we should get it in camera. A good example is the, the way they ended up doing the, uh, the angel flight at the end of the, uh, the film for the battle sequence. You know, we, we thought it was going to be a bunch of uh, green screens with digital doubles flying around and, uh, you know, just animating a lot of shots with a bunch of empty plates and kind of building the sequence that way. But, you know, they were able to go out there, San Pedro, get these helicopters, hang people under them and fly them around. It, it looked like Top Gun. I mean, it looked amazing. And we were just, in the end, we just had to kind of paint out some of the rigging and add wings and uh, banshee effects and things like that. But Lilith was so much more realistic, and it allowed them to cut something together that didn't feel uh, mechanical, I feel, too. Nobody makes a movie by themselves anymore. I had so many people working with me. We had Greg from Rhythm and Hughes, we had Jay from Digital Domain, we had Guy from Weta, and those guys literally took a huge amount of that day-to-day uh, -day work off of my plate. They all respect him so much and he had a great dialogue with them. By the time he would show us anything for our, for our approval, he had gone through it 15 times and made changes. There was hardly anything for us to tweak before we finaled it. He's that good. He's so good. I have to chalk it up to the actors to be able to kind of pretend that these things are happening to them. You know, for instance, uh, Angel behind us. 
if she didn't have anything on her back to except two dots, you know, two dots so we could kind of triangulate later and figure out where those wings should go. We actually started um, with uh, artwork um, and dragonfly reference, uh, and then really just trying to get the essence of what a dragonfly wing is and sort of taking out the ugly parts, you know, and it, we didn't want her to look like an insect. I think one of the things that helped was uh, John's idea of making it really iridescent, uh, which kind of gave it more of a, a beautiful quality. And so the iridescence quality changes, so the color kind of moves across them and kind of gives a more spectral range. It added a cute factor, so I think it, it got to the point where it, was, it wasn't it was creepy. This was our uh, originally our reference for one of our characters, Emma, who's a diamond girl. And uh, this is cubic zirconium. And what we're curious about this is its density presents a similar index of refraction. The look of Emma, on, on paper, it's one of those things that Oh, Diamond Girl, you just take her scan, her body scan, you know, you put her in a cyber scan, get her outline, and uh, put a glass diamond shader on it, and you're kind of done. One thing it turns into is it's easy to recreate a, a giant lump of glass that is totally indiscernible from anything. You know, it, it doesn't really read as a person instantly out of the box. You know, how large, how small do you get the facets? Because if you get too small of facets, it becomes really noisy, and then you can't read her face. If you get too large, she looks more robotic and less diamond. So yeah, it was definitely a challenge. You know, it has to be true refraction, true reflection, and uh, it's very touchy based on what's around her. Because a diamond, what you see is what you're seeing through her, and then what's on top of that reflection, like a mirror. As that for a magic trick? For the Mystique stuff, the original thing we talked about was trying to keep what worked great about the original stuff. You guys who've done it previously did such a great job. It was such a clean idea. I always feel that the scales are a little more uh, organic and softer in, in feel. The color transfers onto them rather than, than sort of a, a spine growing outward and sort of wiggling and then coming down back onto the skin. The hair was a bigger thing because on this film she kind of went from Jennifer who had this voluminous hair in a lot of these scenes and we had to then go to a short little mystique hairdo. The toughest part of this script for me was that the character's powers were sort of hard to define. When we started out for a long time, understanding how Shaw exhibited his power was really tough. I mean, the verbal definition is that he absorbs energy, kinetic energy. And what's the image for that? When we got involved, there was already the idea that the physical manifestation increased Shaw in mass. They wanted to make sure, um, in our discussions with John Dykstra, that when he's hit, when he absorbs energy, the physical manifestation increases his size, increases his mass. Due to the fact of the type of work we were doing, we had to do a completely full digital Kevin Bacon character. So for Phantom B, I took images that we got from John Dykstra, he did a little Photoshop comp, and I combined it with some imagery that Lon Chaney made famous in the Phantom of the Opera. Uh, this was a Phantom of the Opera mask that I created for Halloween based on the original Lon Chaney makeup design. So the forms that I put in, like from the cheeks, I actually also put into this version. In most shows when you're doing a digital double, you're doing one body, one set of hair and everything. Like in this shot just alone, there's six bodies, three heads, uh, three sets of hair, three sets of eyebrows. Um, so it's a lot to deal with in one scene. Having to roto animate all these characters to go through, I mean, this room does not exist. The only elements that are from the plate are the actual characters. They again shot everything on green screen, and we recreated the mirrors, which basically meant that we have to have the actors in digital form so we can reflect them. Based on witness cameras, we animated their performances they had on set, put them in the same place, we recreated the cameras, and so we let the ray tracer do their thing, and we, we got the reflections. Shaw touches Eric and throws him into the wall, and from that point on, we're cracking all the mirrors on impact, we're doing this little distortion type effect when Shaw's powers kind of release, like it affects the glass a little bit, so the whole room distorts a little bit and warbles. 
what started to be more and more tricky is that there's a lot of things that we're used to hiding inside of 3D space because it's not even seen in camera. Here you see his back left, you see Eric Fassbender, I mean he doesn't, he's doing nothing right now in the footage so he would have to be an entire digital double there. You see the back of Shaw, you see the side profile, you see the left side profile. And then as this would come together it's like, um, how are we supposed to do this? Even things that we, we would normally just block out, like this pipe hitting him and falls out of frame, originally it wouldn't matter, but now it needs to interact with the floor and he has to step over it. We do a lot of design up front to try and determine what's practical, both in terms of cost and time, to tell the story, because that's really what this is all in service of, the visual effects. Uh, may be dazzling in and of themselves, but they're useless unless they advance the telling of the story. So um, what we're in is the process, and the process is continuous, and the process will continue until the film is pried from the director's cold, dead hands. Got it, 2M10. Two M10. Thank you. I worked with Matthew on Kick-Ass, which was a hell of a lot of fun. Not long after that, you know, he called me up and said, well, we had a good time on Kick-Ass, do you want to do X-Men? I was like, um, yes. <laughs> he loves hanging out in studios, he loves musicians. He'll come in, he's just been listening to the car, oh, I got this track, track 11 off this score is cool, but it's not as cool as like track six off this other one that I really like. He's inside the music camp psychologically, which is great. The trick about this film is I wanted to recreate the world of the 60s, but I didn't want to go so alien to, to kids when it just feels like a period drama. So I tried to make it as modern and as old as possible, and it's a bloody hard balancing act. Funnily enough, God rest his soul, we had quite a lot of chat about John Barry. There's got to be some 21st century version of Sean Connery in the DNA, you know, and he, he was just sort of generally thinking about John Barry and, you know, the simplicity. I don't mean, you know, patronizing simplicity, but John, a lot of John Barry's amazing and it, it'll roll round. You'll get like a trombone thing that'll go. And it'll do that, you know, for about a minute and a half. They're like hooks, they're like riffs that roll around. That is very appealing. I understand why that's appealing to Matthew, because in a funny way, it's extremely posh pop music. It's not suddenly having some key change and going like, <laughs> you know, and wandering off into all sorts of virtuosic, showy, you know, what Matthew would call meaningless film music. Like all processes, I started playing around mostly for the, you know, Magneto tune. This is all warmer to me. So I was about to bust out my big Barry tune, right? He's like, yeah, I'm liking this. This is cool, this is cool. And then it went. And he's like, uh, don't like that bit. What's that bit? Well, that's the fing tune. And he's like, nah, get rid of it. So he goes, okay, I love the beginning, and then once the tune starts, it sounds like a fucking Barry pastiche. I'm like, well, hang on. Then he, said, and he goes, no, 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 but here's the good news. You've already got it. You've written it. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? If you take the tune out, I've got to write another. He no, no, no. Just play the beginning again. He's like, yeah, that. Uh, uh, no. I said, that's the magnetic. No, that's a Baseline. I'm not going to get through a whole movie with that. He said, no, 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 you're so wrong. That is the Magneto tune. And he goes, I'll tell you the bit I love. He goes, oh, keep playing, keep playing. He said, that, that's f***ing Magneto right there. And he was like ahead of me, because I'd like written that tune. I'm like, I don't know, man, that's a baseline. I mean, you can't go, go, go. Go gang, go gang, go gang. I mean, that's, you know, it's all down here for a start. You know, what about you? You don't need a fing tune. He's angry. 
So just don't, just go, go, just take that first bit and do like more stuff like get rid of all that na 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 shit and you'll, you'll, you'll be fine. And that's why it's cool to work with Matthew, you know what I mean? Because he's, he's sort of taking some aesthetic responsibility before you've even started. Instead of like, well, I don't know, give me something cool. The Argentinian bar is a good example. This is a good idea Matthew had the opening. I think I started the theme a little earlier. And he's like, no, 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 wait, why don't we, since it's in Argentina, can't we just sort of hint at it on like Spanish guitar or something before you actually hear? And only when the ex-Nazis say something that's sort of revealing, that makes him think, ah, these guys are Nazis, then we'll start to get like the electric guitars and then you'll start to hear the tune, you know, in all its glory. Well, I say glory, there's only eight notes of it. Deutsches Bier. Claro. Ja, ist Fitburger. Schmeckt gut, ne? <laughs> das Beste. Right, so everything up till there. Uh, you know, the so we've got the Spanish guitar. You know, and it's all in this, it's using the chords. You'll hear these two chords, but we haven't yet heard. Because, it, you know, it's very expositional. He's just showing up to a bar, he's having a beer. Now we're off, you get, you get the tune. Och, das Klima, ich bin Schweinebauer. Schneider. And when me, when me and Matthew talks about this, it was like, you have to know from the mid, let's have a little gap, because Eric has made the internal decision. He already knows how this scene is going to pan out. These guys are not getting out of here alive. So there's that little hole, and then you hear... And instead of it, you know, when you do a long note version, it's not as sort of angry as going... It's got, it's a bit more kinetic. And, uh, but the thing that I was talking with Matthew is from the minute, from, from once he turns around and starts addressing them, even though nothing's kicked off yet, the music has to be the beginning of a piece of music where you know that uh, this is, this is going to end in tears. Let's just say I'm Frankenstein's monster. And that's how that came into being. You know, sort of character introspective study, you know, in a weird way, where all these guys sort of originated from, you know, there's vulnerability there, unsurety, you know, we're not really sure how to go about sort of uh, channeling these powers. It is the origin of these characters, but it is also the origin of this struggle. It is the origin of the political philosophical debate between do we trust humans, do we protect the people who hate and fear us, or do we actually fight against the people who hate and fear us? We are the children of the atom, my love. If you're a true X-Men fan, you're going to really enjoy the movie because there's so many nods and winks that if you're not an 